The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Summer is here. Maybe that allows time to slow down, savor a good book, be more mindful readers. That's what we're doing all this week with Governor General's Literary Award winning poet and writer, George Eliot Clark. Giller Prize winning authors, Dr. Vincent Lamb and Elizabeth Hay. And writer and novelist, Taya Lim. Tonight, are there must read books? That's next on the agenda in the summer. Um, in our final discussion, I'm sad that it's we're ending uh, on this. Well, I mean, I'm not sad that we're ending on this. I'm excited that we're ending on this, but I'm sad that our time together is ending. Um, uh, I, when we talk about the canons and we talk about classics, the books that we all should have read, I always feel kind of, you mentioned imposter syndrome in another conversation that we had. I feel like an imposter because a lot of the books that are in the Western canon, I only read as an adult, but I didn't study in school. So I always felt like an outsider because um, the schools that I went to, uh, we didn't study those books. Uh, so Taya, is it important to read the classics? Well, I think as an author, you always want to know who you're in conversation with, but who you're in conversation with is kind of up to you. Like there's, obviously we know that there's all sorts of ways that um, works wind up being entered into history and rarely are they through fair fashions. Um, I myself may be similar to you. I had a very strange education. I went to 10 different schools before I graduated from high school. And I think in some ways I like to think that it, maybe it gave me a more interesting voice. I think I probably read through five different types of canons, you know, like bits and pieces of all of them. Um, and I think it winds up meaning that the way that I think and the way that I think about literature is composed by that experience, which I'm quite proud of. Mm. I don't have imposter syndrome. <laughs> no imposter syndrome there. <laughs> what about you, Liz? What do you think? Oh, so many books I haven't read. Mm. You know, it's just endless. Um, if we could think of the of a canon as this wide, all expansive girdle that, that keeps growing as we add books to it, then, then fine, you know. So long as it's not inflexible, mm -hmm. so long as there's plenty of room for uh, new books to enter and earlier books to be discovered, mm -hmm. rediscovered. Does it matter that, um, just to build on what you were saying, Liz, does it matter when these canons were built, um, having this idea of they were built, uh, they were written by certain people of a certain class? Vincent? Well. I think there are reasons why certain books endure, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, uh, it's because they're universal in terms of the human experience. Um, and so to me, if I, if I read Anna Karenina mm -hmm. or The Great Gatsby, uh, it doesn't interfere with my pleasure as a reader to think, well, this is written in a different time and a different social class than my own. I do think, however, that the notion that there are things which should be read in order to be positioned enough to have a voice within society or within some social class um, is, is not only silly, mm -hmm. but it's incredibly limiting. Mm -hmm. And so um, if I think about the place that most people now encounter books, that's in schools. Mm -hmm. And I think schools therefore have a really difficult and challenging task in front of them because do I think that schools should expose young readers to, to some of these works, which are seminal works because they're universal human value? Absolutely they should. Mm -hmm. But do they also have an obligation to expose young readers to books which are part of the conversation that's happening right now well, yes, they absolutely do, because to Liz's point, the canon grows, mm -hmm. the canon shifts. And if we're going to have young readers who care about books and who care about reading, I think one of the most important things we can do is to have them read books which are written to the current cultural moment. Mm -hmm. Well, even just uh, some of the books, the language, we've been talking about language a lot, there's an evolution of language um, and it changes so much time. Would that make having the canon irrelevant, George? 
Um, I like to uh, think about T.S. Eliot uh, only in, in this way, and that is uh, his great essay, uh, Tradition and the Individual Talent where he argues that basically, and he's, and he's aiming his, his essay at poets or, or would-be poets, uh, he basically makes the argument that every poet creates his or her own canon. Now, for him, that would have meant basically the classics of Western literature. That would be his idea of how you should go about uh, putting together a canon. On the other hand, um, uh, each writer puts together the canon that he or she needs for for their own purposes. So, for instance, uh, and and coming back to uh, uh, Vincent's uh, uh, discussion of schools, uh, the place where where this uh, question becomes really fraught is, of course, with university uh, syllabi and with departments of English in high schools about which books exactly are you going to teach? Uh, because, of course, there's a there's a dual purpose for teaching these books. It's to uh, encourage moral reflection, encourage good citizenship as well as enjoyment of, of great writing uh, and so on. But um, an example of the problems that can arise uh, uh, occurred for me uh, in my last course as a PhD uh, uh, student candidate at Queen's University in 1991. A visiting professor put together a course on the Southern U.S. novel. And I was so eager to take that class because I thought, okay, great. Mm -hmm. Finally, here I am, my last course as a university student. We're going to encounter some black American authors. This is going to be great. Then the first day, I show up, and, he, and the professor delivers uh, uh, the course outline, the syllabus. There's not a single black author. This is 1991, not a single black author of the American South on that syllabus. So, of course, I stupidly questioned the professor. Mm. Uh, sir, but you're in university, but, you're allowed to question your professor. No, but you? stupidly. Stupidly, okay. <laughs> because this is a professor who is going to carry a little bit of a grudge mm. if someone were to challenge his well-constructed uh, syllabus. So I did ask the question, like, uh, where's Richard Wright, for instance? Where's Zora Neale Hurston? Mm. Where's Gene Toomer? And, he was, and his answer, they're not good enough. They're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Now, for him, mm -hmm. that might have been an adequate response. But of course, this argument about who is worthy to be taught uh, is, in fact, a very political question in the end. Yes. And, and when I distributed my own syllabus for the same class, which got me in trouble with the guy, but anyway, uh, just so the other students in the class would know, well, here are some black American authors from the South mm -hmm. that you could be interested in reading. So, so the question of canon formation is inescapable because we all form our own canons as, as writers. We all do. I mean, in my home library, I've got, I've got my favorite writers that I go to for my inspiration mm -hmm. and to be reminded about the shape of, of my own efforts in, in literature. You know, it's a, it's a very small list of writers that I enshrine in special bookcases you're crying out loud right but but those are my my peers my i shouldn't say peers but these are my my mentors is a better way to put it uh in terms of instructing me and in how i might want to proceed uh in the end and i'll shut up in a moment because i still have to read one poem but i will i will just say that that i i think there's always a uh, always a debate and and a division between the need to try to tell everybody in a particular culture, y'all should know these books in particular, mm -hmm. uh, but then the, the far more uh, democratizing need to ensure that, uh, that other voices are also heard in order to have a stimulating and inspiring uh, literary culture. Well, so, 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 so speaking to your point, I'm older than you are. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was studying literature, uh, as an English student uh, of, of English literature back in the 1970s, um, it drove me nuts that the literature department divided everything into major and minor, and then unspoken was the less than minor. Mm -hmm. And in the less than minor, again, unspoken, really, but were the women, the Canadians, you know? And that has changed so radically. It really, I, I mean... Why has this it can't, changed? Why has it changed? Mm. Because the world has changed. Mm. The world has changed. And, and, you know, Canadian writing, for one, exploded and keeps exploding in different directions. Uh, and, and, and that kind of uh, condescension 
Well, now, well, maybe it still exists. You know, I don't live in academia. Mm. Uh, but uh, what, what your stories, both your stories, make me think of is when I was in graduate school, and an instructor told me that the color purple wasn't a work of art as a novel um, mm. because it made that instructor feel bad about himself as a man. <laughs> <laughs> but I think. I think <laughs> was there. Well, <laughs> exactly. Is there something about his manhood? And that was what I was going to say. I don't think there's anything wrong with a canon as long as it's clear to students and to readers that a canon is a living thing. Yes. And we learn as much about the list makers as we do about it, the list itself. When what we do we learn it. about the list makers? That they were maybe not comfortable in being men is what you just suggested. <laughs> but yeah, but I think what they're, what were they willing to accept? You know, what in what ways did these works that if we are talking about works of art, they are always dangerous. But at the same time. They were not so dangerous that they, you know, troubled the social order, right? Mm -hmm. So they can they tell us so much about that particular moment in culture. So whether that's because you're a historian or because you want to know your enemy, I think as documents they're very important. When we talk about canon, we're we're concerned about canon because we uh, view it as being tremendously influential, mm -hmm. and I think it may well be influential in the academy. Yeah, but. I don't think publishers think that much about the place of what they're publishing in the canon. There are probably exceptions, like George. George, <laughs> George is an exception. Um, and when when I think about what's culturally influential, mm. well, we're we're not in in some sort of uh, tug of war between books. The canon is Twitter. The canon uh, is TikTok. Right. It's a completely different cultural format, which has supremacy in terms of cultural voice. But kids and are still learning certain books because of a canon in school. Yes, precisely. Mm. Which is why, to me, it's, it's more important than ever that what is taught in schools, that it reaches, that it touches. It can't just be what what we who have read, you know, this number of books, whatever number it is, well, we think this is just so wonderful and awesome, you should read it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't, if it doesn't relate to you, you don't really identify it, well, well, we don't really care because it's the best thing. No, I mean, if we want the, the existence of literature to be canonical in any way, mm -hmm. what people read yes, has to but, matter but, to but, them. But if those things aren't taught in school, the children will never encounter them, never encounter them. And, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. having encountered them once, it's possible you know, the second chance that you give a book, 10 years or 20 years, when yeah. they have children, the book will actually mean more to them. Can I push yes, back a little bit on that, Liz? Um, because um, there was a, I was sharing a story with you all before we started taping, and I said one of my favorite books was by uh, Zora Neale Hurston, Their Eyes yes. Were Watching God. Yes. And I never, I didn't study that in school. I found that book. Mm -hmm. So isn't Which there is there a great. way for people to find the books that they need? Yeah. <laughs> What, what is there? Because I so wish that book would... How did you find that book? Uh, I think internet. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair enough. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I, I uh, haunted the library as a kid. That's how I found books. I think books, books, are are like, books are like ice cream. Mm. You know, if you like one ice cream flavor, you're probably going to try others. Now, you may like them more or less. You may discover that the 10th one is your absolute favorite. <laughs> You know, but but you have to land on some sort of ice cream that you like to try the next yes. type of ice cream. So, so I think that in education, there has to be enough diversity. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be good. It should be it should be good, wonderful books. But there are enough good, wonderful books which are historical, part of the canon, and which are modern that we should be able to expose people to lots of yeah. flavors of ice cream. Absolutely. So. And I, I, just to uh, piggyback off that point for a moment, I will say one thing in defense of the old-fashioned canon. Uh, which is that uh, having been somebody who came through school systems where the, the idea of the great books was there in, in front of me, um, I do value the fact that I ended up reading works that I may not have read otherwise that ended up speaking to me in very powerful ways. Um, I remember grade 10, 15 years old, and doing Catcher in the Rye, J.D. Oh, uh, book. Salinger's mm -hmm. book. Exactly. And the teacher asked uh, the group of us, I think 20 or so uh, pupils in the class, uh, who identifies with this book? I was the only one put my hand up. Because I did, I did identify with Holden Caulfield. Mm -hmm. I saw, I saw the adult world as being full of phonies for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. And I was really pleased to come across a text that made that belief 
powerful and palpable for me. Validated it. S validated it. Mm -hmm. Similarly for reading Titus Andronicus, right? And, and okay, Shakespeare, and it's kind of old fashioned and old hat, Elizabethan English and all that. But when I come across the, the character of Aaron, the great villain, yes. the alienated black intellectual, that's who I, I needed Aaron. Aaron validated that for me, right? The sly, wicked, evil, black intellectual behind the, the power behind the throne. I said, I want to be that guy. <laughs> yeah, I saw you nodding. <laughs> I was just thinking about the fact that I, I think similar probably to, to all of us here, I read so many books as a child that weren't written for me mm -hmm. at all. And nonetheless, I found something in them, yeah. you know, yeah. and they spoke to me. And in some ways that seems like the revenge, <laughs> you know, of someone like me, who is not someone who any of those canonized authors would ever have imagined, is reading their works and connecting with them. It feels like a form of revenge to say, now this is mine. Why is yeah. it revenge? Because, like, for example, being mixed race, I'm somebody who wouldn't be even be legal, you know, at the time when they mm. were writing. You know, I'm a woman, I'm not really supposed to be able to read, you know? So taking that work and saying, now this is mine, it's, I, I'm understanding something about the world. It's told me something about myself. It's given me, like, emotional comfort. That mm. does feel, I don't know, Maybe it's twisted, but to me it feels like a kind <laughs> no. of revenge on someone who's not it. supposed to even be able to read or write, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. George, did you want to read your poem? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. Poem? Oh, great. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, this one is titled Onerous Canon, and it's dedicated for the late, great uh, Derek Walcott. <clears throat> Imbibing libretti and bleak liqueur, I dread the dim shade of dour spectral yates, and defrocked unsavory pound who liked to put negroes in lowercase in their place. For clarity and charity, I plumb John Clare, his sugar fire of port and rum, but shut away whiny beseeching Keats, who should have drunk some Alexander Keats in the pale ale. What can any late maker make of literature Painter, oh poet, I suspect you've ogled blues, golds, grays, adrift in a Venetian sky, gondola over sodden New Scotland and sink in muddy impressionism, gilt scuzzy water in tufted brown fields or gooey ice, drooling with too soon spring. What all our reading comes to, a canon of depression, sorry as January. Words should vacillate in lascivious postures or in notoriously incestuous rhyme. Poet, one great poem, that's all, but you never fail. Composing lines, blustery yet tender. Your voice, your own, Auden in the margins, Elliot, Yates, and Pound in the dungeon. A viriloquous, unadulterated voice extracting black blues from a yellowed Oxford. Okay. Keats wasn't so bad. <laughs> It's I mean, poem. he was dead at 23. It's Give a poem. A break. I like him. I use, I use truth is beauty, beauty is truth all the time. Well, and I agree. Thank truth you. and beauty. All right. He yes. says a place in the poem. Well, <laughs> well a, a kind of pallid place, you have to admit. Well, he was a sort of pallid guy. He, so. <laughs> he well, wasn't a pallid guy. I'm he was teasing. not pallid. You're not going to visit him as a friend. I, 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 I wrote a poem for him. So I, 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 like, I like the guy. Don't worry. <laughs> but just to build up that, Liz, um, you know, and this is <clears throat> nothing against Keats. Um, are there, <laughs> I'm just promising that. Not. It's just coincidence. Um, are there some works that are revered that don't hold up today? Uh, you know, I don't read them. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they don't hold up, I don't waste my time on them. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, life is short and I'm running out of time. Mm -hmm. So these days, uh, um, the book has to be pretty damn good. Well, and, and, and I reach into the past for some of the books that I uh, have never read. Some of the Russians I've never read, you know. I don't want to be on my deathbed and thinking, God, why didn't I ever get to that? If you were to give advice to anybody who's building a canon, what would that advice be? How should they build that canon? Oh, not worry about it. <laughs> Just read. <laughs> Just read. Yeah. Yeah. What about the rest of you, Taya? Do you mean somebody who's building a canon for mm -hmm. schools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think, you know, being a little bit critical about what makes a canon what it is, you know, being able to understand um, what are the social forces that form it. And remembering that in our current climate, 
I think it's 80% of books go nowhere. Only 20% mm -hmm. of books that are published actually find a readership. So isn't the job of someone who's doing that kind of archive work not only to find like the easy hits, but also to find books that were beautiful and meaningful and universal and timeless and just because of whatever sort of random coincidences didn't mm -hmm. necessarily find a large readership in their time and to kind of recuperate them, which I feel like is what you're talking about with Fitzgerald. You said only 20% um, reach a readers. Yes. As a writer, that makes you feel what? Terrible. <laughs> 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 because I think one thing that you also realize is that both success and failure are extremely random and arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Plenty of books don't succeed because they weren't very good, but that doesn't mean that all books that don't succeed were bad. In fact, there's all sorts of, every single day, um, books are published that just don't wind up finding traction. Last year, I had the honor of sitting on the governor general jury, so I read every book that was published in Canada, and there were so many that were just beautiful, wonderful books, people doing really exciting work, really interesting work, mm -hmm. and just the nature of the market is that only, like, if we talk about the modern canon, like, if we think about like the you know books to read in the New York Times or the CBC, it's like maybe 20 books that get onto those lists. They're the same books over and over again. Mm -hmm. I find that really alarming. So I do feel like the job of anyone who's creating a canon is to attend to the nature of the industry, right? Um, and to, to find people who were lost, to make sure, like, yeah, you gotta have some of those people on there, you know, Nietzsche, Orwell, Beckett, right? All those people, they sort of need to be on there because they did set the tone, right? Mm -hmm. They are seminal works. But what else is there that is missing, right? That would give us a fuller picture of what really happened back then. We only have about three minutes left, but I want to hear from you, uh, Vincent and George. So, Vincent? Well, when I think about the concept of a personal canon, I think about the, the things that one would want on one's bookshelf in the last home in which one lives, the last room one inhabits, the books that one wants to have as friends. Um, when one considers what, what one has read. And so I think the only way to find that is to read with a sense of intentional vulnerability. Hmm. And I, I think we read for many reasons, and that's fine. We read for entertainment, for escape, um, you know, for, for all kinds of reasons. But I, but I think if we're talking about a canon, we're talking about books that mean something in our lives. And for that to happen, mm -hmm. we have to be open to being changed by the books. Mm -hmm. And that means we have to be vulnerable to, to what they have to say to us. Is that what you mean by intentional vulnerability? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Being, being open to the spirit of the book, the characters, the writer, not presuming that the book is going to make me feel a certain way or another way, but, but, but letting it happen. Mm -hmm. What about you, George? When I was 16, my mom was taking me to, uh, driving me to high school in Halifax. And I was leafing through uh, an anthology called Poetry of Our Time, published in 1966 and edited by Louis Dudek. Mm -hmm. And as I was leafing through it, I came across uh, the section featuring Ezra Pound. And I happened to read his uh, reworking translation of the Chinese Tang Dynasty poet Li Po's poem, A Song of Chen Can, which Pound retitled The River Merchant's Wife, A Letter. Yes. And as I read that poem in the back of my mom's car, I suddenly felt I was hearing Mississippi blues all the way from a thousand years before, from 800, 900 AD. And, and I knew I wanted to write like that. I wanted to get to that kind of level and so I started to read Pound. And as I read Pound, I discovered that he had fascist sympathies. I discovered that he was anti-Semitic. I discovered that he was sexist, uh, racist uh, in general, imperialistic, all kinds of negatives. But I kept going back. I kept reading. I, I, read, I remember reading the cantos. Why did you keep going back? Because it was something compelling about this difficult character. Yes, and that's a fabulous, you know, yeah. River Merchant's Daughter. Yeah, River Merchant's wife. wife. Yeah, River Merchant's wife. A letter, um, and and uh, yeah, and I really found it very compelling, and I, and I and even though I can and I do loathe the politics, this is the gentleman who created really, <laughs> practically by himself, modern poetry in English, and so I knew I and had a to. And Allen Ginsberg forgave him. Yeah, he did. He did. Yes, that's right. Uh, he went to visit him in St. Elizabeth's when he was incarcerated there. But to get to the point of this anecdote, um, 
uh, continuing to read Pound and reading, I remember reading uh, The Cantos is all about the, the, the conspiracy between arms merchants and bankers to always be sending people off to war to die. That's uh, Pound's thesis in The Cantos, the governing thesis of that, of that uh, uh, massive poem, long poem, epic poem uh, of his. Uh, and I remember reading it, standing in line in the Royal Bank of Canada, RBC, and I'm reading Pound, the Cantos. Holy smokes, this is great. What a thrill it was. But to get to the point of the anecdote, reading Pound and consistently reading Pound meant, meant I had to go and read Dante, which I did in English. Uh, it also meant that I became more familiar with Italian literature in general in translation. But then that brought me to the world Vincent of Italian pop music of the 1960s. And how wonderful it is. You're crying out loud, cha 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 everywhere. Italian jazz. You're crying. Um, and, and, uh, and so just following that one writer yes. opened up so many other avenues mm -hmm. of exploration for me in terms of literature, in terms of art, in terms of music, and so on. That, and I gotta say this, I, I gotta end it myself by, by just saying this. That in the end, and I think this is true for all writers, not, not just poets, but particularly for poets, in the end, we are servants to the art. We are servants to the muse. We are servants to the art. The art must always come first, must always come first, no matter what. And if, in fact, we follow that muse, if, in fact, we follow that art, we will end up creating glorious works no matter how the world may receive them, they will be glorious because they will be imbued with all of our love, all of our passion, all of our affection will be there. And, it, and some people will find it, some will find it and revel in it and feel more alive because of their encounter with, with those works. And yes, there'll be those who will come to suppress and repress and so on. And guess what? they will end up in Dante's Inferno. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a phenomenal way to uh, end our week together. I can't begin you, to say thank you so much for being so generous with your answers. Um, it just feels the passion and the commitment to your craft. It's such, it's been such a gift to have this time with you. Thank you, thank you so much. We appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Our guests all this week were George Elia Clark, author of many books, including Where Beauty Survived, an Africadian memoir. Dr. Vincent Lamb, whose new novel is On the Ravine. Elizabeth Hay, author of the just published novel, Snow Road Station. And Taya Lim, author most recently of An Ocean of Minutes. Next week, we'll get summer serious about food. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.